Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And uh, I am thrilled here today as I launch uh, into my new role as the ranking member on this um, very important subcommittee. Uh, investment in science and space has helped drive the American economy since World War II. It's unleashed American innovators and entrepreneurs to develop new technologies that have changed the world. And it has helped us understand the changes in the world caused by human activities that alter the environment and the climate. This subcommittee has an important role to play in ensuring that science and space activities continue to help America thrive. Today's hearing title invokes the frontier. Next month, we'll celebrate the centennial of President John F. Kennedy's birth. Science and space were an integral part of the new frontier that he saw in 1960. His challenge to land a man on the moon opened up a new era, one in which human travel and live beyond the Earth. Now, there are a few arenas of modern life in which space does not play a role. From satellite navigation to telecommunications to monitoring storms, we rely upon space. But in the next few years, there will be even more activity in space than we have ever seen in our history. In less than a lifetime, we have gone from one man circling the globe to contemplating settlement on Mars. Now, as space exploration and activities evolve, it is vital that we use the lessons of our past to guide us as we navigate this expanding territory. Prior to major settlement of the American West in the 19th century, Congress funded a number of scientific expeditions to explore and understand the Western territories. This government investment helped identify productive agricultural land and initiated a transportation revolution with the transcontinental railroads that allowed individuals and companies to succeed in the space age. Government investment in science has gotten us to the moon but, and has put a rover on Mars, a satellite or orbiting Saturn, and has gazed into the depths of the universe. The Cassini spacecraft just began its grand finale this week and is the f in the first of its orbits around Saturn right now. The James Webb Space Telescope is set to be launched next year. Government investment in science has led the way for the private investment that is now flowing into space activities. Congress has a critical role to play to ensure that public and private investment is driving innovation and responsible development in space. And even as private companies expand their space activities, there is still an important role for public investment. Today, the International Space Station serves as a national laboratory, which has dedicated space for science experiments from universities, federal scientists, and small private research firms that could not otherwise be attempted. These experiments are varied and diverse and have the potential to solve some of the biggest problems humanity struggles with today, including improving the quality and quantity of our global food supply, finding new cures for cancer, understanding antibiotic resistance, and so much more. We all stand to gain from supporting basic science research in space. We must also remember that space exploration and development is a global endeavor. It requires international cooperation and global standards, even as the space industry becomes more competitive. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on our growing American commercial space enterprise uh, so that uh, all of our country can begin to understand this incredible future that is about to unfold. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Bigelow, what role do you see uh, public-private partnerships filling in regards to maintaining a national laboratory in space? I don't see it as a zero-sum game. I don't see it as a choice of either or. Uh, if if uh, if I were in in uh, in a position of decision for for NASA, I would say I would want both. I would want to uh, harmoniously blend the uh, the uh, the obtaining of, of commercial assets uh, under affordable circumstances and reliable circumstances, and be accustomed to their operation, acclimate my own core, 
astronaut core to those, those facilities, those platforms, uh, concurrent with the operation of the ISS. Um, and then at the time the ISS is eventually uh, repositioned or reassigned other uh, mission maybe involving commercial uh, uses or not, uh, then I would already have uh, platforms in place in low Earth orbit where uh, at, at the same time that those are, those are uh, being uh, positioned, I would be able to increase the size of my astronaut corps. I would increase the size of the population of uh, Johnson Space Center because now there isn't just one platform to monitor and to operate. Uh, there could be three or four or five. And the advantage with the commercial sector is that the, those platforms, the ones that would be added, would be at a small fraction of the cost of the original station. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Meyerson, uh, Russia, India, China, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, there's going to be a lot of traffic up there as each year goes by. How, how would you suggest that we work together in order to ensure that there are a common minimal safety standards that are established and adhered to uh, globally? Well, I think the, uh, uh, the FAA is currently doing a very good job of, of developing those standards. Um, and uh, what we need as, as, as space gets global, we need more launch capacity. And so with the long-term vision of millions of people living and working in space, it's going to be not just uh, Americans, but it's going to be uh, people throughout the world that are, that are living and working in space, and we'll need launch capacity to do that. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting and, and urging is a, is a very streamlined process for doing that so that different companies in different countries can demonstrate their, their capabilities and their, that approach. So. And, and what would be, from your perspective, the correct mechanism to use in order to ensure that there is a minimal international safety standard? You know, I, I'd be happy to, to provide an answer to that one on the record. I'm not really prepared to, to, to answer That's that question, fine. but it's, fine. No, it's, a, you, it's, a, it's a complex we're, question. So We would appreciate it. Anyone yeah. Thank you. on the panel have any suggestions? Well, I think initially the philosophy is uh, less regulation is better <clears throat> while maintaining the context of, of common sense and uh, safety and, uh, and organization. You know, so we, we have... Two or three years ago, we, we were working with George uh, Neal and FAST to acquire a policy change within the FAST. And that was achieved where uh, we, our company was, was used sort of more or less as the guinea pig, where uh, <clears throat> launches would not be sanctioned from, from uh, U.S. territory to be uh, vectoring a payload uh, in a, to a location on the surface of the moon where Bigelow Aerospace had some kind of activity ongoing. And that is, uh, was a policy change. <clears throat> the next step from that is to, uh, in addition to that, would be probably to prescribe a standoff distance, because that was mute, uh, as to if there were, if there were some kind of, of miscalculation in the delivery of that payload, what is the logical standoff distance of safety? Would it be 300 kilometers, 250 miles, whatever? Uh, as a radius, so that you have that ge geographic protection. Thank you. Uh, and it may be, uh, I'll just throw this out for anyone who wants to take it. What is the role of the Air Force going forward? Um, do you see that uh, ultimately being phased out and the private sector will just be in charge of its own responsibilities? Can any of you take that as a question? Mm -hmm. We would like to see a, a space command have a presence in space. We would like to actually see that um, those kinds of assets um, are reached, are accessed earlier than later. We think that the NRL, the FRL, uh, could use those kinds of locations for unique laboratory purposes. Great. Yeah, and, I, and I'd like to add, the, the, the urging is on uh, FAA regulation of commercial launches. The, the Air Force, of course, has their own missions that are of a national security nature and would require a different, a different type of, type of uh, Oversight and, and that is absolutely necessary and essential. So, uh, and we'd see that continuing. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.